everybody. Welcome back to the Data Science Hangout. Hope everyone's having a great week. For anybody joining us for their very first time today, welcome. This is actually our second to last Data Science Hangout for 2022. Um, so thank you to everybody who's been with us this whole year as well. This is an open space for the whole data science community to connect and chat about data science leadership, questions you're facing, and getting to learn about what's going on in the world of data science and getting a view into different industries and use cases. We share the recordings of these sessions to our posit YouTube, so you can always go back and rewatch or find helpful resources. And sorry, I am three weeks behind, but I will do that <laughs> this week and update them. Together, we're all dedicated to creating a welcoming environment for everybody, no matter what industry or background or experience you have, we wanna hear from everybody. So there's always three ways that you can ask questions and also to provide your own perspective. It doesn't have to be just a question. You can jump in by raising your hand on Zoom and I'll be on the lookout there. You can put questions into the Zoom chat and feel free to put a little star next to it if you want me to read it out loud instead. Maybe you're in a coffee shop or something. And then third, we also have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously. Um, I will mention too, if you wanna connect with people after the fact, we do have our LinkedIn group for the Hangout. I know right now, not too much conversation goes on in there, but would love to create that space where you can easily find each other. Um, you do have to manually turn on notifications in that group, so that might be part of it. Uh, but I am so happy to be joined by my co-host for today and our friend from the Data Science Hangout, Javier Orica Daku, Lead Machine Learning Engineer at Centene now. Congrats on the new role. And Javier, I'd love to have you uh, maybe reintroduce yourself because I know you've met a lot of us from, from past weeks as well and share a little bit about your role and, and the company now and maybe something you like to do in your free time too. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, and it's great to be here. Um, this has been, I, I've told many people this, I really do mean it. This has been like my favorite standing meeting for the last year and a half or so. So I feel like you've been doing an awesome job, Rachel. Um, and I love this kind of Thank like you. platform for knowledge sharing and whatnot. But yeah, uh, my name is Javier Orakadatku. Um, I've, you know, been around the finance, corporate finance, and sort of data science world for um, like 15 plus years. Um, I've, I spent a lot of my career in consulting, doing different types of financial modeling around valuation work, um, different types of like economic studies, like, um, you know, economic obsolescence studies, functional obsolescence studies, some tax optimization type work. Um, and in those days, I was mostly using Excel. Um, we would do some, you know, SQL or SQL work, but it was pretty minimal. Uh, whenever we were doing that, I was actually using Microsoft Access. Um, I feel like that's not really a tool used nowadays, but at least at the time when we were working with you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of records, um, it was much easier to do the same types of group buys and sort of summations that we were doing in Excel, just, you know, in for bigger data using access. So um, I went back to grad school. I really wanted to get into data science. It was kind of a buzzword. I was reading all about predictive analytics without really knowing what it was or what it meant, but it excited me. Um, I wanted to really get my hands on that and understand how I can take sort of the forecasting or, you know, modeling skills that I had sort of taken it to the next level so that I could start trying to automate some of my work or some of the reporting that I'm doing. Um, so I went back to grad school. Uh, and yeah, when I got out of grad school, I joined Centene. I was with them for about two years. Um, I quit to go work for an e-commerce startup for about a year, and I just recently returned to Centene. 
Um, I'm on week two in a new org, so bear with me if I can't answer all the questions about my work. <laughs> but um, yeah, here at Centene, I'm a lead machine learning engineer. I'm part of a scrum team that uh, is a joint effort with different data scientists and data engineers. And we're partnering with our business stakeholders and really taking these like high ROI, you know, predictive modeling concepts and putting them into production. Um, yeah, something I like to do for fun. I love playing board games. Um, I feel like I spend way too much of my free time reading about developments in the R world or, you know, Python developments. Um, I mean, I enjoy it. A lot of times I'm just reading about the stuff, not really even, you know, applying it through code or anything, just trying to keep up with all the trends that are happening. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thank you. I have to ask, what's your favorite board game? In terms of being able to explain it to friends or play it quickly, I love Splendor. It's a card game. It's uh, two to four players. It's especially if the people you're playing, you know, playing it with have have had a few repetitions. It's a really fun kind of quick game. Um, yeah, it's great. Thank you. I'll have to check it out. Okay, I see the questions are coming in right off the bat, so you don't even need me for the first minute here. So somebody <laughs> asked anonymously, uh, when is when is machine learning appropriate or necessary? Okay, so I, I come from a heavy Excel background. So I will sort of caveat my response by saying, um, you know, my views might be a little more nuanced than someone maybe coming from like a CS background or someone especially nowadays, I mean, I feel like people graduating from undergrad and going into master's programs are like diving straight into machine learning, which is awesome. Um, but I will say there is a lot of, you know, reporting or KPI creation or, you know, evaluating different KPIs that doesn't require um, machine learning. And that is also high value because it helps the business track whether or not some different product or you know program is is successful um where i mean anytime like machine learning can be used for inference or prediction um and i feel like both kind of sides of this machine learning equation add a lot of value for different reasons um when it gets to you know prediction um I'd say this is where you really want to make an intervention of some sort, or you know, you you want to focus on a subset of your overall customers or consumers and either give value to them or help the business maybe by um, you know mitigating the risk of churn. Um, there's just a lot of reasons. I'm not giving a great answer here, but and I'm happy to give more detail. But if that individual's you know, if you're willing to send, submit another anonymous question or something, I'm happy to dive further into that. Yeah, thank you. And Bill, I see you just put a question into the chat. Do you want to jump in next? I'll start reading and then you can jump in if you want to add any context too. Um, but Bill asked, how big is your team at your new wait, hold on. <laughs> How big is your team at your new job and maybe break down by roles? Um, use of R and or Python is more used in, ex hold on, sorry. I need to, <laughs> no, I need to I break actually, down the I question see. a little bit. Or do people yeah. still try to develop new or run old models using Excel? Yeah, that's and, a good question. Oh, Bill, was that you? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Oh, there yeah. you are. So, so, so I asked because um, I work at a biotech company and some guy was uh, uh, giving his presentation of this fancy model about drug pricing prediction and all this kind of stuff. 
And I said, oh, well, you know, do you use SaaS's, you know, add-on product that costs mega dollars or, or what do you, what's this done in? And he said, he said VBA. And I said, I didn't quite understand because, you know, he has an accent to me, an American. And I said, VBA? And he said, yeah, it's a VBA. So anyway, that's, yeah. that's, what, that's one of the things that prompts uh, what you're talking as well as your prior um, uh, discussion of your experience. So thanks. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a really good question. And again, like my Excel experience is nuanced. Um, I would say 99 uh, let's say 90% of people using Excel are using it as a big calculator. Everything's sort of ad hoc, just sort of thrown together. Maybe they're using pivot tables, but there's no real like modeling workflow to their Excel work. Um, then you have maybe 10% of people that are actually using Excel in a more advanced way where they actually have like, you know, an inputs and assumptions tab, which is just straight up text explaining the purpose of the model and what's going to happen in the in the subsequent tabs um and you kind of go from like your records maybe one tab is just you know straight tabular data you know names or identifiers on the left and then a bunch of different calculations on the right and then going sort of left to right or right to left you you get to summaries that are actually consumable for leaders in the business um and then there's probably like point one percent of Excel users that are using it in a pretty advanced way, whether it's, you know, like logistic regressions or different types of linear regressions. Um, you could do a lot of Monte Carlo simulations. There's a lot you can do. I mean, when you start feeling like the GUI itself isn't, you know, uh, sufficient enough, v VBA or Visual Basic, it's, uh, you know, programming language that plays hand in hand with Excel, and you can actually do a lot with sort of automating the workflow or the the sequence of calculations or group buys or whatever with VBA in Excel. Um, I will say that is not typical of Excel users. It's also very limiting because with more sort of open source programming languages, not only with the languages themselves, but with all the libraries that are available for these languages. Um, there's just so much development happening on a daily basis. And I, I feel like for what you described, while it could potentially be done in VBA, if you wanted to scale something, that is consumable for that business organization or for other data analysts or business analysts, you know, at your company, you probably want to take the results of those findings and push them into some data warehouse or something that again is, is consumable to a larger organization. And in order to do that, you need to figure out, okay, well, where is this code going to live? When is it going to be refreshed? Is it going to be retrained? How is it going to be retrained? you know, what systems are going to help us take this overall logic and put it into a production setting so that me as a data analyst or a business leader can just access some table on a data warehouse and see the results I want to see very quickly and know that they're updated at any point in time. Um, that's where I feel like moving towards, you know, Python or R kind of opens your world of possibilities within the context of like, automation and machine learning. I don't know, Bill, does that answer your question? Oh, we don't hear you. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sort, sort of, kind of. So again, I, like, I don't know how big your, your company is and I don't know, uh, you, you know, so there's always challenges. Like one of those challenges you're talking about scaling and having an infrastructure, well, a lot of companies I'm familiar with, that means that you bump into IT and IT, you know, I also work in a regulated industry. And so IT seems to be like the regulator, like they like to, they like to squash um, the kind of thing that you're talking about, even though it totally makes sense to me and other people in the business thing, but then they're worried about people having too much access to stuff. Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I find myself, I find myself, I find myself rambling. And I think the main thing I wanted to know, I just wanted to know, uh, so you come back to this new place, 
do you have the tools to to do this and are you making an impact or are other people still like on their own computers doing excel and being ha being happy and and being right. able to present a report every every few weeks to somebody who pats them on the back and says hey great okay so we're there's like 70 plus thousand people at centene it's a massive company um <clears throat> i design i mean they're i think they're like a fortune 26 company you really don't know the name because by design compared to the other health insurance carriers, um, they wanted to have kind of a portfolio management company. And then, you know, each state that we operate in sort of has their own brand. Um, with that, the majority of our analysts and probably data scientists and biostatisticians work for the brands doing kind of plant specific analyses. Um, I, where I'm at now is kind of the corporate group. Um, and we partner with stakeholders in the business at different operating units, or um, we partner with, you know, ideas, uh, idea generators that, that want, that have a business use case that can be scaled for the entirety of our business, not just one plan. Um, from that perspective, you know, I, I think there are some differences between like, like I roll up into IT now and I definitely sympathize with you because when I was previously at Centene, I was actually working for HealthNet, which is one of these state plans. And there's a lot that I wanted to do to put into production, but, there's so much sensitive data in production that corporate sort of, um, you know, helps manage the whole process of getting a model into an actual production setting, a model or a shiny app or something like this. So you can do a lot as a data scientist in a business org, you know, in the development and test environments that are out there. But when it gets to production, then there is somewhat of a handoff in um, ownership, if you will, um, or responsibility of, of getting that code into a production setting. Um, and that's where the, there's a kind of hand or you know handshake or pass off between sort of the business scientists and then you know the um, the corporate data science team. And there's really? there's probably so seventy thousand people. We have an ongoing chat of about 500 data analysts and data scientists. There's, you know, different, again, like clinical informatics people and biostatisticians. And there's a lot of very interesting niche work going on. Um, but the one thing that I really love about this organization is the, the knowledge sharing. Um, there's a lot of that that happens organically. Um, you know, I love that there's not a lot of shame in asking questions. It's encouraged. If you don't know something, go ahead and ask it. Um, I have, you know, no shame when it comes to asking people for help, but at the same time, uh, you know, on the flip side of this, if someone comes to me, I'm definitely going to try and make some time to help this individual with their problems, um, just to kind of balance it all out. Absolutely. And I, I always love seeing in the chat, everybody kind of commenting in on what they're experiencing in their organizations too. And Nessa, I love to hear what you're doing there too. That's great. Um, I see, Eric, you had asked a question a bit earlier in the chat. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, it's great to have you, Javier, um, on, on the Hangout. Um, as part of, a, part of my organization and the group I'm in, I would say we're kind of growing into getting AI and ML more entrenched in some of our work, but leadership will hear all the positive buzz from various tech sectors. And they say, we want to use ML, but what I'm wanting your perspective on, if you could share any insights is how do you approach finding best use cases to use the algorithms without going down potentially dead ends or making sure that leadership understands that ML is not going to magically be the perfect solution for every use case. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say, 
and I, I'm new to this process because again, I was sort of a ad, you know, a one-off data scientist in a business org prior to joining this corporate team. Um, and so I, I'm still learning about all our systems and everything that, that's available. But one aspect of this team's work, which um, you know, I think could be applicable at other companies is to have a really structured sort of intake process for people that have new, you know, everyone's excited about ML and AI, but there should be some sort of detailed or uh, like an educated guesstimate of ROI for the projects that people want to put in. And that's really hard to do. Um, even for experienced, you know, developers and data scientists. It's, so I would say if you don't already have some type of like, you know, intake process or something like this, where your business stakeholders that might have ideas can come in and request um, some type of like company wide, Eli Lilly wide, you know, project that as part of that submission um, or as part of a conversation that your team has with them is to really try and like quantitatively determine what the benefit would be. Um, I mean, I think that is gonna go a really far away. I'm still learning about our whole intake process, but a lot of my health net peers, um, you know, now that they know that I'm back are like, hey, can we partner with this? Can we partner with this? And I'm like, there is sort of a, like we are trying to prioritize the high, highest ROI, um, you know, projects and there is an official intake program. So I'm pretty much just sending them information on, hey, here's, here's the forums, you know, please populate them. And um, yeah, that, that seems to have helped a lot or help this team scale out their models a lot. And, and prioritize which models to actually put into production. I hope that answers your question, Eric. Oh, that's, that's very helpful. And there are certainly pockets where we do have some of those things in place for more general project ideas or more general initiatives. But yeah, it's, it's growing the ML case in certain parts of the business where that just has not been implemented at all. We're yeah. trying to find the best ways, but that's good advice uh, nonetheless. Yeah. I really I like to, the, oh, you go ahead. I, I was just going to tell Eric because he, for those of you who don't know, he has an awesome podcast and he runs the shiny developer series, another amazing, you know, resource. Um, I just wanted to comment that um, now that I'm in this corporate team, there's a lot that like some of my old colleagues that I'd work with closely, I wouldn't actually recommend them to submit you know, uh, a use case for us because their problem is so like brand or, you know, problem specific. Like it's not something that can be scaled. Um, I noticed there were, I, I'm still like taking trainings and stuff. So excuse me for, you know, not knowing like everything about the org now, but before I left, Shiny was becoming really popular. People loved seeing what a Shiny app could do um, I would say that I'm like actively sort of telling people who have no R experience, but have heavy Excel experience for certain dashboards they envision in Shiny that maybe a Power BI or just Excel dashboard is the way to go because they'll be able to get what they want much faster. Um, you know, the overhead to sort of design this is like making their project a shiny app is almost unnecessary from what I see. Um, so, I mean, I love shiny, but I, I, I think even for like finance orgs or actuaries or, you know, people that are doing a lot of maybe heavier analysis in Excel, um, where you wanna convince them that, hey, Shiny might be the best place for you is when they're trying to get into scenario testing or like machine learning or 
like basic things, you know, they've got 2 million records that they've somehow hodgepodge together in Excel, but you know, when they drop, when they make different selections in an Excel dashboard, it takes three minutes for the dashboard to re-render. Like that's a good use case to put it into Shiny because that three minutes is now all of a sudden two seconds. Um, that's when I'm like a very big outspoken advocate of, hey, you should have some dedicated resources on your team, either learn about R and Shiny, um, or, uh, you know, if this is a problem, that you think could be scaled for the entire business, then uh, consider submitting some type of intake intake form so that other other business units could also make use of this type of shiny app. Yeah. Thank you. I see a lot of great questions coming in, and I really like the way you describe the the open culture at Suntine and it being okay to ask questions, but also get like providing that time back to people and, and being so willing to help. I see Libby, you had asked a question about the community at Centene, I believe. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so I hope I'm not remembering incorrectly, but I'm pretty sure you had a hand in starting our user group at Centene when you were there previously. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because that's a difficult task and you have to like recruit people and getting people to meet up and help each other and stuff like that um, is really challenging. So I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a rundown on how that happened. Yeah, uh, thanks, Louie, and great to see you. So um, there was, I sort of piggybacked from a general data science community chat that we had at the company. Um, and you know, there were several hundred people on this of varying backgrounds and expert expertise levels. And so there was a lot of conversation happening. There was already a Python group that was meeting, I think every other month. So me coming in like three weeks after I started, I got really excited about the possibility of potentially creating something similar for R, uh, R users. And so I think it started by just reaching, trying to figure out who owns that already existing data science chat and see if they could help support the idea of creating a Python, or sorry, an R user group, you know, something to meet once a month or once every two months. Um, because I think at the larger companies, getting that type of like top level, level kind of executive uh, you know, stamp of approval and support can go a long way, especially if that individual is part of the already existing IT or data science function. Um, and so, yeah, at the time I created a blog down site, for those of you who are familiar with our markdown, blog down is just kind of a, you know, it's a package that allows you to create static websites, uh, static blogs with our markdown. Um, you know, Distill is a very similar concept. Um, Quarto, now with Quarto, you can do the same thing, creating websites. Um, and I, yeah, I love the syntax of Quarto. But anyway, uh, so we started, I think what started is like 13 users the first month. One of them is at our studio now. I don't know if he's on this chat. Uh, Dave Grunwald, he might be here. Anyway, hey. Uh, hey, Dave. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> hey, thanks, Bob. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, so Dave, and great. I, um, it, Dave taught me shiny. I tell him this often. I owe like my current career to Dave because it made shiny itself made me such a better overall programmer. And the way I think about functions and recycling code, like seriously, thank you, Dave. But um, yeah, what started with about 13 users uh within a few months jumped to about 100 125 you know monthly users that were on this our specific uh monthly meetup um so we had a really great time uh, you know the partnerships we had with posit we were able to get uh some people to come in and do workshops as well um it was yeah it was it was just a great way everyone was so collaborative and it was such a great way to see the excitement around 
what you could do with like all things R um, and even Python. Like how can we tap into this, these robust like, you know, Python libraries or Python and like we had reticulate sessions where it was, you know, a co-branded Python R kind of workshop where we're looking at ways in which we can actually, um, you know, communicate between teams of different languages a lot easier. And so anyway, I, I had a great experience with it. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I see a few anonymous questions I want to make sure to jump over to as well. And one was, how do you navigate stakeholder uncertainty and incongruent project valuations for data science projects versus more traditional engineering projects? That's a good question. I, I don't know about traditional engineering projects, to be honest. Um, I don't feel like I've been surrounded by that world enough to, to like speak, you know, it, yeah, I, I really don't know. When it comes to the data science projects, um, at least at the point, I feel like where we are now, um, you know, just really careful, objective, kind of unbiased review of what the ask is um, has been very helpful. Um, being able to like, in however way you want to do this, like it doesn't need to be just a dollar value. Like what savings are we going to have or what benefits are we going to have? You can kind of score the different potential projects coming in um, where at least project to project, you can prioritize which one is going to have the most impact for the business or you know, an impact can even be measured differently. Like which one's going to have the most short-term impact? What's the, what's the best project for long-term impact? I mean, maybe all these things could be different weights for your scoring of these different projects to understand what your team should focus on. Um, but yeah, I would say trying to develop some system or framework where you can actually um, like help prioritize or rate the importance of these new projects is really helpful. Thank you. And there's actually a follow-up anonymous question to that too. And I'm going to start just copying the Slido questions into the chat so people can see them as I'm <laughs> reading them as well. But the question was, what does an ROI timeline look like for most projects? Are you working on things that come to life years down the line? I actually do not know yet, but I would say a lot of these probably come to life within the same year. Yeah. I don't think they're like, I don't think the planning is so far ahead. There are larger IT goals and things in motion that could be like a multi-year type of transition. I just don't work on those types of projects. The focus of my work is more data science specific. Yeah. Thank you. Jared, I, I see you asked a question in the chat. Do you want to jump in live? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. So yeah, I guess for me, it's more like I can relate in a heavy way to the one-off kind of background to what you're doing. And so a lot of the obstacles I've always tried to overcome is just kind of applying you know my particular skill set in programming to um to the work that i'm doing but having more of like a medical and epi background has been a huge benefit to me but is something that is often like lost in translation to to leadership or to did we lose jared or was that me no i think we lost him Jared, you froze. Well, I'm sure Jared will be back in a few seconds. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, did you get uh, the sense of the question? Let's uh, let's wait a, a second. We'll jump to one so Jared can hear it. The answer. Let me jump. Let me jump over to one from some Slido, and then we'll go back to Jared. Okay. Yep. Um, but the question was you've got epidemiologists and biostatisticians in your organization. 
as in pharma, do you see any change from those folks using some, <laughs> I get it, some alternative software to R? That's good, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I work in a most, mostly Python dominated world. I mean, most of my colleagues are Python, uh, Python users. There is, from an object oriented programming perspective, there is a lot that is going on on a daily basis that they're working on, um, which is more like traditional engineering related, not specific to data science or inference or prediction. Um, I am a huge believer that you should use whatever um, you feel most competent in. If you feel restricted by a certain technology, like if you feel restricted by some alternative software, um, you can, you know, start exploring R or Python or Julia. Um, you know, you'd probably want to start with like whatever's most like closely aligned with the syntax so that it doesn't feel like you're having to, you know, pull your hair out while you're trying to work a full business day and learn a new language. Um, but yeah, I'd say SaaS comes with a heavy price tag. Um, the maybe sooner you can become comfortable or find a way to replicate the same type of work with an open source programming language, um, you might find yourself able to do things just as fast and with maybe uh, a more robust like skill side or capabilities with the language, um, you know, to, to visualize or iterate or make predictions. Thanks, Javier. I'm worried about Jared now. He's not back yet. So we'll, we'll hold Jared's <laughs> question. Um, so I was actually going to try and figure out how to work this into the conversation because I love this example when you share it. And somebody asked anonymously, did you create a branded test shiny app in applying for your return to Centene? No, I didn't. Um, luckily, I had several apps in production. We were doing some really neat things, um, you know, when I was at HealthNet. So we had several apps that were in production. It got to the point where like managing some of the pipelines for the different apps was becoming a bit of a like of a recurring more time consuming process the more apps we had all of a sudden we found ourselves needing to continue to streamline like data intake or transformation for some of these different apps and so we created a web app updater that was it was itself a shiny app but also capable of updating other shiny apps or at least the code from other shiny apps that kind of stuff, um, you know, it's not typical to see that kind of stuff with shiny apps, at least not the shiny apps I've seen. So anyway, where I was going with this, the production team I am now part of, um, or like the corporate data science team, at least they had some samples to kind of chew off of, of the type of, you know, our work that, or shiny work that I could do. But that, I would say for, for organizations not familiar with, um, you know, Plotly dash uh, apps or Streamlit apps or, you know, shiny apps, being able to show them the speed of um, a web application like shiny um, and how kind of like clean it can look with uh, an advanced UI, um, that definitely goes a long way, in my opinion, to, um, you know, impressing the people that you were interviewing with. For anybody who didn't see it before, didn't know what that question was referencing to, Javier had shared before that in an interview with Bloomreach, he created a uh, interactive shiny app that used their branding and color scheme. And so I just put that into the chat too, so everybody can see the blog post that he made about that. Yeah, um, Travis Gerke, I, I don't know if he's on here today, but he had asked if he could reference this as a cover letter accessory in one of his uh, R, R talks. And I was like, of course, yeah, please do this. But at the time, my 
GitHub repository for it was just like, you know, a super high level readme. It was, you know, oh, this is a shiny app that I styled with Bloomreach theme. Um, so I, I wrote this blog post um, just in an effort for people that are less familiar with shiny or maybe with R. I tried to write it in a way where, um, you know, people with basic like Git or GitHub understanding could go in there and clone the repo and, um, you know, try and tweak the, the app to their liking, to their company. Um, yeah. I'd love to just put it out there. If anybody else has other apps that you think would be really helpful to share with examples like this, feel free to put them into the chat too. So we can all see. I love to see all the resources shared in the chat. Um, jump in. Oh, you go. I, I was just going to say Absalon as well. They're a consulting firm, data science consulting firm. They make some incredible shiny apps. Um, they have some beautiful, uh, you know, shiny app examples on their gallery, uh, on their you know public facing website. The our, the shiny website itself. Um, I, I don't know what the new posit link for it is, but that has a bunch of galleries, uh, a bunch of gallery ex examples on their gallery with both like you can go in there and launch the shiny app. You can also see the source code behind each and every one of those. So that's a good way to learn too. Sorry, Rachel, cut you off there. No, this is your show. <laughs> I want you to share everything. Um, I was trying to just share some of those links into the the chat there too. But Jared, I see you're back. Can you hear us? Yes, hopefully I'm not cutting out. Can, sorry, the weather here is terrible. But no, uh, no worries. We can no. uh, we can hear you now. Okay, short and sweet. I wanted to make sure to not answer your question when you you dropped off. So let's circle back <sighs> to the beginning. Okay. Okay, so short and sweet, just wanted to get your opinion on if grad school was the way to go to getting you um, to feeling like you were um, able to open up the doors for more data science and machine learning type roles, or if kind of having that one-off um, background. I mean, ideally for me, it's like I come from kind of a hybrid. I've got my um, background is more in public health epi, but then I do more programming and, uh, you know, clinical type work. But having that heavy medical background has always been an asset. So I did know from your background, if you felt that was the, the way to get your feet in the door, or if you were more um, like, was it a benefit? Or do you feel like you could have got there without, I guess is the, the short answer. Grad school allowed me the time to be able to get to where I wanted with like the basics of data science and programming. Um, if I was in a full-time job throughout that time, um, e e you know what, even if I didn't have a full-time job, I think grad school just gave me sort of a, a set routine for being able to learn this stuff. I don't actually think you need a graduate degree to, you know, get into this type of work or I lack the discipline to learn all these topics and concepts just on my own. Um, and for me, I found that grad school really did help just uh, push me to, you know, learn not Python and R, more specifically, like to learn about um, the math that underpins a lot of the data science that we're doing now and, um, you know, how to apply these different algorithms to business problems. That, the way in which grad school sort of force feeds that information to you, I think the alternative learning it on your own would just be really hard. I don't know that there's any one resource that, um, and I, I'm sure there are some great ones out there. I just don't know of any sole kind of resource that would give you such like a robust um, or like holistic understanding of data science. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jared. Yeah, no, I think it really does. I. I, there's so much to learn and it's kind of like trying to stay ahead of a movie train and it, 
it always makes me kind of curious to know how your um, I know it's not a one size fits all, but your like the right approach to learning this versus trying to just ingest such large amounts, you know, like consistency, like you said, and being kind of being holding yourself personally accountable to, to, to train yourself through that, but just knowing and kind of understanding a, if there's a better way. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I get it. Um, yeah, for me, I kind of knew the kinds of data science work I wanted to get into. I mean, I was doing I wasn't calling it this, but I was doing time series forecasting. That was sort of my bread and butter in financial modeling. Um, and so I knew of all these different techniques for time series that were possible. Um, I just didn't know how to, you know, I didn't know where to start. And so grad school for me really helped sort of open the doors of what's possible with code for different types of time series problems, you know, like, yeah. I see Hugh, you had you had asked a great question in the chat a bit earlier. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I first want to say thank you to Javier. I've been super excited for this talk. Um, and he's had very a, a number of kind comments on LinkedIn and chats in the past. And I've always been really appreciative of his willingness to to engage like that. Um, so thank you. This is awesome. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, with you standing up uh, in our group and uh, potentially converting people, um, when you're showing somebody R uh, for the first time that they may potentially move over, um, what are some of the things that you focus on, i.e. like the visualization aspects or the cleaning transformation side or the modeling? Um, I know oftentimes it feels like the <clears throat> consumers of the products are really excited about the visuals, but the day-to-day -day people get more excited about like the quality of life things and, and uh, you know, the ease of working with data. So uh, just curious if you had any uh, insights on that. I mean, I think where I've had the most success is less so on like the end end consumers who might be looking at, you know, a shiny app or uh, some type of visualization and more on the people generating the numbers or summaries that might later turn into a visualization or some type of shiny app. And so with that, um, where I feel like I've had the most success with teams that are using, you know, SAS or Excel um, is really with just the data manipulation capabilities of something like R. Um, like firstly, the tidyverse, which has grown so much, but the idea of sort of a, a unified syntax for data handling um, and just showing them the basics of dplyr and tidier. Like this is how you group by one or many you know, variables. This is how you can do a summation. Um, this is how you create new columns of sums. Here's your summary data. This is how, you know, using tidier, this is how I can pivot really wide or really long or maybe you need to do both for a certain calculation. Um, showing them the speed that, you know, in which this could be done has always really impressed people. That's where I've kind of had the most success is kind of the, the, the basics of these things, not even the really advanced, you know, topics or concepts, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, the pivoting is always where people go, what? <laughs> for me, like, <laughs> yeah. but thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question in the chat I see is from John. Do you want to jump in next? Nope, not yet. So it is, you went from Excel to lead machine learning engineer. Can you tell us about the journey? Anything you found surprisingly hard or easy? I had a really good, I mean, because of SQL, I had a really good understanding of at least how tabular data could be joined and the different transformations that could be done to these data objects. Um, I think I would have really struggled without that kind of like basic understanding. But having said that, I think the parts where I really struggled at first was like function writing. Function writing was not intuitive to me. Basic function writing was, but 
in general, I found it to be very complicated. Um, and it took a solid, I, I don't know, three to six months of practice to feel actually comfortable function writing. Um, even when I started building Shiny apps, you know, basic Shiny is quite easy, but large functions underpin the entirety of a Shiny app. Everything you do within Shiny is effectively writing functions. So the process of learning Shiny and becoming more comfortable with Shiny was very difficult and something that just took a lot of repetitions. Um, but it all sort of played together because while Shiny is, you know, more like people think of it more as like a front end type of system, it did make me a much better programmer in the way I thought about actual functions and function writing. Um, other things that I found hard. I mean, looking back, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but reproducibility of machine learning was not something super intuitive either. Like, um, you know, being able to reproduce a code set and get the exact same predictions every time, I wasn't quite sure why this wasn't working um, or how to like create these fixed views, you know, setting a seed or whatever you need to do to, to ensure that someone else downstream could replicate your study or analysis and get the exact same findings themselves. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that's kind of what you were looking for, John. Thanks, Xavier. And somebody had asked anonymously on Slido, what IDE, if any, are you and your colleagues using for development work for Studio, Emacs, Vim, VS Code, Notepad? I think all of the above, honestly. Yeah. Um, I use RStudio every day. Um, so I'm in the RStudio IDE. Um, I seem to be in Terminal a lot these days, just, you know, like the shell writing bash commands and whatnot. Anyway, um, but yeah, the RStudio IDE, definitely where I spend most of my time. I know that you are two weeks into this <laughs> new role, but is there, like, if you think of the next year ahead in this role, what are you most excited about or what made you most excited about this role? For me, it was more, I'm really excited about the challenge that's going to come with becoming a better just overall software engineer or, you know, become better at programming at large, not just R specific. Um, I'm like constantly humbled at everyone I work with, um, just their breadth of knowledge with all these different systems. Um, I've sort of, touched a lot of these different systems for, you know, ML ops or ML engineering. Um, but being able to really dive deeper into some of these um, platforms to, to get production jobs out of any language, I'm really excited about the challenge there and, and, and you know, the growth and learning opportunity. Thank you so much, Javier. And I know we have five minutes left because you do have a meeting right at the top of the hour here. So I want to make sure that there weren't questions that I missed over on Slido or through the chat. I just happened to see a question. It said, anyone using VS Code for R Shiny? I've tried this. I still feel like R Studio itself is just like the gem for coding in R. Um, but I do really like VS Code for Python. Thanks, Javier. This is Daniel. I, I asked that question. I, I asked it because I, I write a lot of R in my position as well. And I write a lot of Shiny applications. And I've started to think about VS Code because I write my Python and Postgres in VS Code. And I would just kind of like all that to be together. Um, but as you mentioned, VS, uh, you know, VS Code is not ideal for our and our studio really is the best, or was it? Is that really the best place for writing our code these days? And just kind of wondering what where others are in that. Yeah. Yep. I see a few 
comments in the chat to Daniel and different perspectives. And in the minute, few minutes or so we have left here, I know there were a lot of questions in the beginning and comments on like Excel and, and data science. And I was just curious, circling back to that conversation, like what do you think has been most effective for you at like bridging the gap between those two teams or two sets of users? Because I know there are some people who are, are probably always going to stay in Excel, but you might need to work with them as well. And what have you found helpful? Like data extract, if you're, if you're working at a company that's large enough where um, it doesn't need to be a large company, but I feel like at larger companies tapping into databases um, or you actually have databases, you're not just operating in a world where it's Excel files or CSV files, um, then showing how you could kind of stay within the same, you know, our notebook or framework from data collection, just pulling it straight into your environment, you know, manipulating it there, you, writing it out or summarizing it as, you know, an HTML file, like knitting an RMD to an HTML file or um, a flex dashboard or something that's still static, but interactive, that has gone a long way too. Um, and the speed of everything, like the speed of the data manipulation and data handling for millions or tens or hundreds of millions of rows, that always shocks people because if you've got a lot of columns in Excel, after about, I don't know, three, 400,000 rows, your Excel is crawling and you can look at your RAM and it's eating up your entire available RAM. Whereas, you know, with something like Python or R, it's definitely not the case. Thank you. I, I was scrolling the chat and I see a lot of people <laughs> weighing in with comments on talking people out of PhDs and <laughs> suggesting that as a topic idea. Um, but Javier, before you go, I know in the beginning, you also mentioned like one of the things you like to do for fun is keeping up to date on everything that's going on in the data science space. And I was curious if there are other like resources um, or maybe people you follow or things that you'd like to share with us all? Um, let's see. The Tidyverse blog, in terms of staying up on news related to Tidy Models or Tidyverse, um, that's great. That's one of my favorite resources. Um, the RStudio AI blog, or posit AI blog. That's another good one. Just kind of looking at the incremental developments with um, Torch, which is like native Torch for R, and then looking at, you know, Luz, which is sort of like the Keras for Torch. Um, that stuff really excites me. Um, Twitter has been amazing. So keeping up on Twitter with just a lot of the um, R related, you know, R stats or shiny or other sort of Hashtags like that, um, that's been a great resource. The R bloggers um, or R weekly, that's, you know, R weekly is a great publication. You can subscribe to their XML um, and just get like a weekly download of new packages, new updates to existing packages, new tutorials. Um, Eric Nance runs the um, R weekly podcast. Um, he's one of the co-hosts there. Um, yeah, there's just a plethora of resources out there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Javier, for, for joining us and sharing your insights this week, but also in other weeks as well when you're on the audience side. Um, I did want to let everybody know, because this comes up sometimes, because there's great comments and resources in the chat. You can save the chat. Um, so the little three dots to the right-hand corner, if you press that, you can save the chat too. Um, but I will try and group them to share with the recording when it goes up to the site as well. Thanks, Thank Rachel. You. And yeah, if anyone wants to you know, contact me, feel free to hit me up on um, LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. Twitter as well, but I, use, I don't use Twitter as much. 
Awesome. I know you have to jump. So no worries if you have to leave us here. I'm going to share you, your LinkedIn in the uh, chat as well. All right. Great. Thank you so but much. Hope, yeah, thank you. And hope to see Thanks. everybody back next week. Um, we will be joined next week by JJ Allaire, a CEO and founder of our studio now, Posit. Uh, maybe he heard that as he's walking by here, but excited to talk with uh, JJ next week as well. And that will be our last hangout for 2022. It's so nice to see you all this week. Have a great rest of the day.